So I'm happy to introduce Kent from MIT. He's going to talk today about can a Zhang twist be a co-cycle twist? OK, great. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to speak. So everything that I'm going to say today is joint work with Hong Di Huang, Van Nguyen, Charlotte Yure, Padmini Virapen, and Xing Tang Wang. Well, so, so you can see that there are two parts to the title of my talk. So Zhang twists and co-cycle twists. So the first thing I wanna do in the talk is tell you what do each of these twists mean? So the first setting is the setting for a Zhang twist. So here A is gonna be a possibly non-commutative, but always unital and associative uh, algebra. And I want it to be graded um, so it's a direct sum of n, n index parts, and the multiplication preserves the grading. Um, throughout most of the talk, I'm going to work with quadratic algebras. So in other words, they're going to be generated in degree one, and the relations are all going to be in degree two. E.g., of course, polynomial rings. And a, another important adjective that goes along with um, quadratic algebras is AS regular algebras. So it's not too important what the technical definition is for this talk, um, but the general idea is that they satisfy certain homological and growth properties, which generalize polynomial rings. So we think of them as something like non-commutative polynomial rings. Um, a, a commutative ring is AS regular, if and only if it's isomorphic to a polynomial ring. So the definition of, of a Zhang twist is if we have a graded automorphism phi uh, of A, then the Zhang twist A phi is gonna be an algebra which coincides with A as a vector space. But now we twist the multiplication by phi. So R times S is equal to R times phi to the degree of R of S for homogeneous elements R and S. So these were defined by Zhang in the 90s. And uh, an important property that Zhang twists have is that they preserve the category of graded modules. So this is particularly important for uh, in, in the field of non-commutative algebraic geometry because uh, Zhang twists preserve AS regularity. So one of the primary topics in non-commutative algebraic geometry is in classifying AS regular algebras. And because of Zhang twists have been really useful in that field um, because uh, it kind of reduces the problem to classifying AS regular algebras up to Zhang twist. So what is that supposed to be? Sorry, is there a question? I just mean the degree of R. So here R is a homogeneous element in A, and that's just whatever the, the degree of R is. Um, so then you would uh, extend, uh, extend to non-homogeneous elements. So you can just define it on homogeneous elements. And then if you have a non-homogeneous element, it breaks up as a sum of homogeneous elements. Um, so to tell you what the multiplication is, all I have to do is tell you what it is on homogeneous elements. Any other questions? OK, great. OK, so one family of examples. So we're going to assume that the characteristic of k is 0, and a is, is a scalar, n is an integer greater than or equal to 1. Then the lacoutre sierra algebras, um, R and A, are, so it's a, it's a family that ranges over all such n's and a's of quadratic art and shelter regular. So art and shelter, I just mean as regular. Um, so they have n plus 1 generators. And these are the relations that we quotient out by. 
So they prove that if, if B is in the field, uh, they define a graded automorphism phi sub B of Rn zero, which just sends the generator xj to the, the sum of B choose I, xj minus I. And Lacoutre and Sierra prove that uh, RNA is the Zhang twist of RN0 by the automorphism phi sub A. So in other words, they give kind of a, an infinite family. So for a fixed N, all of these RNAs are Zhang twists of one another. You might ask, um, so are these non-trivial Zhang twists? So of course, if they were isomorphic as algebras, um, that would kind of be the, the trivial Zhang twist. And they prove actually that these are, as long as n is greater than or equal to two, um, these are non-trivial Zhang twists. So if a is not equal to b, then rna is not isomorphic to rnb. So this gives kind of a, a rich family of examples of, um, of non-trivial Zhang twist algebras. Okay, so I want to move on now to the context of the second part of my title. So co-cycle twists. Um, so first I want to just recall some background on Hopf algebras. So an associative algebra is going to be a Hopf algebra if, so we have a co-associative co-multiplication map. So this is a map that goes from H to H tensor H, and this should be an algebra map. We have a co-unit epsilon that goes from H to K. And we have an antipode, which is an anti-algebra homomorphism, H to H, which satisfies this compatibility diagram um, with the rest of the uh, Hopf algebra structure. So here mu is, is the multiplication. So it goes from H tensor H to H. Um, and eta is the unit of the algebra. So some classic examples of Hopf algebras. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen them before. So we have group algebras of finite groups. So here the co-multiplication sends G to G tensor G. The co-unit sends G to one and the antipode maps G to G inverse. So these are for all elements G of the group. And then you would extend these maps linearly uh, to the rest of the group algebra. Universal enveloping algebras, U of G are also Hopf algebras. So here, if you have an element x in the Lie algebra, then co-multiplication will send x to x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x. The co-unit will send x to 0. And the antipode sends x to minus x. And then lastly, another classic example is the coordinate ring for an algebraic group, or more generally, the coordinate ring for a group scheme. And so something that's going to be really important in this talk is the category of comodules for a Hopf algebra. So I just want to briefly recall this definition. So a module for a Hopf algebra is a vector space with an H action. So an, an action is going to be a map that goes H tensor M to M, which satisfies this commutative diagram. So here there are two ways to get from H tensor H tensor M to M. So if you go along the top and along the side, you would act by the first tensor and of H, then act by the, the leftmost tensor and of H. The other thing you could do is go down along the left side, which is multiply the two elements of H together, and then act by that one element. So a coaction is going to be very similar, except we're going to reverse all the arrows. So now a coaction is going to be a map that goes from M to H tensor M. And now it's going to be compatible with the co-multiplication. So here we could co-act once and then co-act a second time. That would be going along the right. Or we can go along the bottom and co-act and then apply the co-multiplication in H. OK, so these are co-actions for Hopf algebras. Um, and so a vector space with a co-action, um, which, which respects the co-unit, is going to be a co-module. So if H is a Hopf algebra, 
then HOM HK, just the linear maps from H to K, is going to be also an algebra. This is called a convolution algebra. And the multiplication here is going to be, so I need to tell you how to multiply two of these maps to get a new map. So if F and G are maps from H to K, then F times G applied to an element H is just going to be the new map, which is co-multiplication composed with F tensor G composed with the multiplication in K. So in other words, we will often use the Swedler notation, which is that delta of H is equal to H1 tensor H2. Of course, this is a little bit misleading because really delta of H can be some linear combination of elements of this form, but um, this is the, the common notation. So in that case, then we would write F times G of H is going to be F of H1 times G of H2. And now we can define two co-cycles. So a two co-cycle is going to be a map from H tensor H to K, which is invertible in the convolution algebra. And it has to satisfy these conditions. So in other words, if we take the sum of sigma of X1, Y1, sigma X2, Y2, Z, this has to be equal to the sum of sigma of Y1, Z1, sigma of X, Y2, Z2. And it's also compatible with the unit. So sigma of x1 is equal to sigma of 1x, which is equal to the co-unit, just epsilon of x. So this is a two co-cycle. And now we can define a two co-cycle twist. So this is a way of twisting the multiplication of a Hopf algebra using a two co-cycle. So it's going to be the same vector space as h, we're going to endow it with the same co-multiplication, co co-unit and unit, but now we're going to twist the multiplication uh, by the two co-cycle in using this formula. So again, this is all using Swedler notation. And a really classic result is that um, the category of co-modules of H is equivalent as a tensor category to the category of co-modules for a two co-cycle twist of H. Okay, so to, to summarize the situations that we've we've built up now, so in one in the context of kind of uh, non-commutative algebraic geometry, we're interested in studying graded algebras, and given a graded automorphism, we produce another graded algebra, which is the Zhang twist. And this preserves the category of graded modules. On the other hand, if we're interested in Hopf algebras, um, then we can take a Hopf algebra, take a two co-cycle. Then the two co-cycle twist is another Hopf algebra. And now this preserves the category of the tensor category of co-modules. OK, so so far, these two concepts really live in uh, two distinct kind of different worlds. So the next thing we're going to do is try to bring these, um, bring these two worlds a little bit closer together. And one of the main ways that we're going to do that is through Menin's universal quantum groups. So if you have an associative algebra, then Menin's left universal bialgebra is defined as the bialgebra which coacts on A in a universal way. So what I mean here is that I have a coaction of, of NDL of A on A, so this is the top row. And if you have another coaction by a bialgebra B, so this is tau, then there exists a unique bialgebra map F from NDL of A to B such that this diagram commutes. So this is the left universal bialgebra. Well, you could just as easily define the right universal bialgebra. And if you replace every word bialgebra in sight with the word Hopf algebra, then you get the universal Hopf algebras, which are going to be denoted by ought R of A and ought L of A. But OK, 
So like many things that are defined in terms of a universal property, it's often useful to have a more concrete description of what these things actually look like. So if you have a quadratic algebra, then end of A has a concrete description. To, so to do that, I need to set up some notation. So if you take two algebras, two quadratic algebras, then the bullet product is going to be defined as, so you take the free algebra, which is generated on A1 tensor B1. So here A and B are both generated in degree one. So A1 is just the space of generators for A, likewise for B1. And then the relations of the bullet product are going to be S23 of R of A tensor R of B. So here R of A are the relations of A, R of B are the relations of B, and S23 is just the map on this fourfold tensor product, um, which just flips the middle two tensor factors. And then it's a result that the, say the right universal bialgebra is equal to A, the bullet product of A with A shriek. And here A shriek is the Kazool dual of A, by which I mean, so just take the free algebra on the dual space of the generating space of A, and then quotient out by relations which are the perpendicular space to the relations of A. So quotient out by all of those um, elements of the dual space, which vanish on the relations of A. So this is the Kazool dual um, of a graded algebra. Uh, and the universal bialgebra is just a bullet product with, with the Kazool dual. And end L of A, so the left universal bialgebra, is just equal to end R of A shriek. In other words, it's A shriek bullet with A. So that was kind of a way to describe the Manning's universal bialgebras. So to describe Manning's universal quantum groups, so the Hopf algebra level, we need to recall um, the construction of, uh, of Hopf envelopes. So the forgetful functor from Hopf algebras to bialgebras has a left adjoint, which gives a Hopf envelope for any bialgebra which just satisfies this universal property. So there's a bialgebra map, which goes from B to H of B, such that if you have any bialgebra map phi from B to any Hopf algebra H, you get a unique map of Hopf algebras F so that this diagram commutes. And then Menin's universal quantum group is just going to be the Hopf envelope of Menin's universal bialgebra. Okay, so now we can kind of state one of our motivating questions for this, this project. So if you start with a quadratic algebra and a graded automorphism, then we could take the Zhang twist of A by phi, and a natural question is, okay, so what's the relationship between the universal bialgebras of A and A phi? And you can also ask the same question on the level of the Hopf algebras, on the level of the universal quantum groups. And in particular, what, what you might conjecture is, is it possible that these things are, are Zhang twists of one another? Uh, is it possible that they're two co-cycle twists of one another, in which case their uh, category of co-modules would be equivalent? Okay, so if you start with a graded automorphism of A, then we get two bialgebra maps on the universal bialgebras. So on one hand, you can, you can get a map that's end L of phi. Um, so these are just using the universal property. And you can also get end R of phi shriek. So end L of phi goes from end L of A to end L of A. And R of phi shriek goes from end R of A shriek to end R of A shriek. But recall that end R of A shriek is the same thing as end L of A. So in other words, we get two bialgebra maps which go from end L of A to end L of A. And these motivate uh, our definition. 
So we call a, a pair of algebra automorphisms, a twisting pair, if there exists the following, if, if the following conditions hold. So if phi one, if you do phi one and then do co-multiplication, this should be equal to co-multiplication and then identity tensor phi one. And phi two and then co-multiplication should be equal to uh, co-multiplication and then phi two tensor identity. And if you do phi two and then phi one and then the co-unit, this should be equal to the co-unit. And of course, I said that these were motivated by the maps in our the previous slide. So we have the obligatory lemma that the maps that I that I showed you in the previous slide are an example of a twisting pair for n L of a. And in in fact, every twisting pair of n L of a arises in this way. So some elementary properties of twisting pairs. So if you have a twisting pair, then these maps commute with each other. And delta composed with phi one tensor phi two is just equal to delta. And phi one is uniquely determined by phi two and vice versa. Okay, so if psi is a bi-algebra map, which goes from B to B, um, then we obtain a unique map that goes between the Hopf envelopes of B. So just directly from the universal property. So now uh, if we have a twisting pair for a bi-algebra, then the natural lemma is, okay, then these uh, extensions of Psi to the Hopf envelopes form a twisting pair for H of B. So in order to, to use these twisting pairs, we need to require a few additional conditions. So we say that a bi-algebra B satisfies twisting conditions if, so as an algebra, now we want it to be Z graded. And we want the co-multiplication to send the N degree part of B to BN tensor BN. And we can note, so, from the, from the construction, we can observe that if you start with a quadratic algebra, then end of A does satisfy these twisting conditions. So what we're doing right now is kind of building up some general theory, but I always want to keep in mind this motivating example of the universal bi-algebras and universal quantum groups, um, which, are, which are kind of motivating these definitions. And in general, if a bi-algebra B satisfies these twisting conditions, then so does its hop envelope. So in particular, the universal quantum group satisfies these conditions. Okay, so our proposition now is that if we have a bi-algebra and it satisfies the twisting conditions, then for any graded bi-algebra automorphism or hop algebra automorphism, automorphism if B is a Hopf algebra, then the Zhang twist is again a bi-algebra or a Hopf algebra, uh, and it satisfies the twisting conditions again. So explicitly, if H is, is a Hopf algebra, then the new antipode of H phi is given by S phi, which is just phi to the minus degree of R S of R for a homogeneous element of, uh, of H. So now if we have a bi-algebra, which satisfies the twisting conditions, then for any graded bi-algebra automorphism, we have a Hopf algebra isomorphism, which is H, so the Hopf envelope of B psi is isomorphic to the Zhang twist of the Hopf envelope of B by the, uh, by the new graded map H of psi. So here to construct this isomorphism explicitly, um, this it comes from the universal property. Um, so the isomorphism is this map F. Here the uh, the diagonal map is 
um, well, B psi is the same as a vector space as B. H B, H psi, is the same as a vector space as just H of B. So this map I psi is really just as a vector space map, it's the same as the map I sub B that comes in the definition of the, of the Hopf envelope. The point is one checks that this is still, uh, still a map of bialgebras once you've twisted both sides. So um, this is a legitimate bialgebra map. And then we obtain F by the universal property and then show that F is, is in fact an isomorphism. Any questions so far? Okay, great. So if you take a Hopf algebra, which satisfies the twisting conditions, then for any twisting pair, we're going to get, okay, if you compose these two things, then this is a graded Hopf algebra automorphism. And we can define a map sigma, which is H tensor H decay, which is just defined by, so sigma is just defined as uh, sigma of X, Y is epsilon of X, epsilon of phi two to the degree X of Y. So this is for, uh, of course, for homogeneous elements X and Y. And if we define this map like this, then this is a two co-cycle and it's convolution invertible. And the convolution inverse is given by a similar formula, which uses phi one. And then our, our theorem is that in fact, the two co-cycle twist, if we twist H by this two co-cycle from part two, then this is isomorphic to the Zhang twist of H by the composition of these two maps given in the twisting pair. So of course, as a, as a consequence, uh, H and H phi one composed with phi two. Uh, so this, this Zhang twist are Morita Takeuchi equivalent, um, which, which just means that their categories of co-modules are equivalent. So a corollary is, okay, if we have a bialgebra which satisfies the twisting conditions and we have a twisting pair of B, so this is something that we've already seen, which is that we get a unique twisting pair of the Hopf envelope of B, which extends this twisting pair. Then we get a, a two co-cycle twist of uh, the Hopf envelope of B. Uh, and this is the same thing as the Zhang twist of H of B by H of phi one composed phi two. Okay, so I wanna kind of put this all together in, in our motivating example case, to so the case of the, say for instance, the left universal quantum group. Of course, an analogous thing holds for the, the right universal quantum group as well. So if we have a, a graded algebra and a graded algebra automorphism, then we have, okay, so then the universal bialgebra satisfies the twisting conditions. And we have this natural twisting pair that comes from, from phi and phi inverse shriek. And then this extends to a twisting pair for the universal quantum group. And now we can compute. So if we take Ot L, so this is the universal quantum group for the Zhang twist of A. So this is just by, by definition. So this is from just from the definition of the, I mean, from the, the concrete construction of the universal bialgebra. So just this bullet product. And then you can show that, um, well, the Kazool dual of A phi is equal to uh, so in other words, the Kazool dual of a Zhang twist is equal to the Zhang twist of the Kazool dual, uh, except now what you're twisting by is phi inverse shriek. And then this is equal to, so just the Hopf envelope of, so again, this is, this is something that, that you can show. So in other words, this is, this is saying that the bullet product of two Zhang twists can also be written as the 
Zhang twist of a bullet product. And now we get that this is, this is just H of a Zhang twist of the universal bialgebra, which is just a Zhang twist of H of the universal bialgebra, which by just the previous slide is equal to a, a co-cycle twist of the universal quantum group of A. Okay, so this is kind of our, our answer to our motivating question, which is, so this is our kind of slogan, which is if you deform a quadratic algebra via Zhang twist, um, the goal here being, okay, so it preserves the category of graded modules. Then on the level of universal quantum groups, this deforms the universal quantum group by a co-cycle twist. Um, so in this case, it preserves the tensor categories of co-modules. Okay, so what we've seen is that um, we've given some examples where um, Zhang twists of Hopf algebras by twisting pairs are two co-cycle twists. So something that I wanna point out is just, on the other hand, um, in general, we expect that these are only a very special class of co-cycle twists because, I mean, we don't expect that um, most co-cycle twists could be realized as Zhang twists. For example, you could, I mean, this is kind of a, um, uh, a kind of a silly example, but you could take any Hopf algebra, view it as a Z-graded algebra, where you concentrate everything in degree zero. Um, in that case, it satisfies the twisting conditions. Uh, and in that case, all Zhang twists are trivial because everything is in degree zero. So, I mean, clearly there, there exist two co-cycle twists, which are non-trivial. So, um, so in general, we would expect co-cycle twists of, of hop graded Hopf algebras um, are probably a much more general thing than those co-cycle twists, which could be recovered as Zhang twists. So I want to spend um, I want to spend the rest of the talk looking at some more examples. Um, yeah, maybe before we go to examples, are there are there any questions? Okay, yeah. So so we've kind of seen how twisting pairs play out in our our big motivating example, which are Manning's universal quantum groups. But for the rest of the talk, so I'm going to look at twisting pairs for various other families of Hopf algebras um, and see what, what twisting pairs um, look like. And a, a twisting pair makes sense even when the Hopf algebra doesn't satisfy twisting conditions. So the twisting conditions are what guarantee that the Zhang twist of a Hopf algebra by a twisting pair gives a two co-cycle twist. But you could still consider twisting pairs even when the Hopf algebra doesn't satisfy the twisting conditions. And in, I mean, in fact, you can consider twisting pairs um, even when the Hopf algebra isn't graded. So the first example I wanna look at is, okay, let's take um, coordinate rings of algebraic groups. So then given an element G in G, we can obtain an algebra automorphism. We can obtain algebra automorphisms, R, G, and L, G, which go from O, G to O, G. Uh, and these are just induced by left and right multiplication by G. And then what we can show is in fact, every twisting pair of OG has the form RG LG inverse for some G and G. So in other words, in, in this case, um, what we're basically getting is twisting pairs correspond to conjugation by elements in the group. So in this, I mean, this is an example where 
I mean, there's no requirement that this coordinate ring is graded at all. So this is kind of an example of twisting pairs where, um, I mean, there's no context for Zhang twists here, but we see that it still recovers something. Um, I mean, some very classical operation, right? I mean, conjugating by elements of a group. So the next example I want to look at are the co-sovereign Hopf algebras. So if we have a, an invertible matrix F, then the universal co-sovereign Hopf algebras introduced by Bichon. Um, so these are the algebra with generators. So we have these n squared generators that come from these, these I mean, matrices U and V. Uh, and, and the relations can be presented um, by the following lines. So these kind of come up in, uh, in Morita theory or uh, um, yeah, so the, I, I think that the, the use of these co-sovereign Hopf algebras is that uh, a Hopf algebra is co-sovereign if and only if its co-module category is sovereign, which means that there's a, an equivalence between the left and right duality functors. So here, the Hopf, Hopf algebra structure on the co-sovereign Hopf algebra can be given uh, explicitly. So the co-multiplication looks like um, typical matrix co-multiplication. Um, and then the antipode gives S of U is the transpose of V. And S of V is the transpose of U, except then you conjugate by this invertible matrix F that comes in the definition. So then any twisting pair of this co-sovereign Hopf algebra uh, is determined by a pair of invertible matrices, A and B, such that A, B transpose, I mean, is the identity matrix, and B, F, A transpose, F inverse is equal to the identity matrix, is equal to F, A transpose, F inverse, B. So in other words, B is the transpose of A inverse, and F A transpose is A transpose F. So therefore, we can, we can write down every twisting pair very concretely. Um, so it's given by uh, phi 1 of U is equal to, so you just multiply the matrix U on the right by A. Phi 1 of V is uh, multiply V on the right by A inverse transpose. And then phi two is similar, except um, we're going to multiply on the left by A inverse and A transpose um, for some matrix A that commutes with F transpose. So this is a way to write down all twisting pairs for the co-sovereign Hopf algebras. So, uh, so the next example I wanna look at are pointed co-commutative Hopf algebras and characteristic zero. So here, the adjective pointed just means that all the simple co-modules are one-dimensional. So um, it's a classical theorem that H is isomorphic to a smash co-product, a smash product of a universal enveloping algebra with a group algebra for some, some specific group and specific Lie algebra. So here, by smash product, what I mean is, um, so as a vector space, this is just H1 tensor H2. Um, I mean, as a vector space or as a co-algebra. And then the multiplication is deformed um, by an action of H2 on H1. Um, so the multiplication is now given by A tensor B times C tensor D is equal to A B1 acts on C tensor B2 times D. So in this case, a twisting pair is going to be determined by a pair of characters, rho and chi. So rho goes from G to K, chi goes from G to uh, invertible elements of K. And then in fact, every twisting pair, um, 
of this Hopf algebra is given by, so phi one of an element X from the Lie algebra is going to be X plus rho of X. Phi one of G is going to be chi of G times G. Phi two of X is going to be X minus rho of X. Phi two of G is going to be chi of G inverse times G. So this is for any X in the Lie algebra, for any G in the group, um, for some pair of characters, rho and chi. And we can note, so for this, so this should have the adjective pointed here. So for any twisted, twisting pair of a pointed co-commutative Hopf algebra, we can look at these formulas and observe that in fact, um, phi one is always an inverse to phi two. So what this says is uh, all the Zhang twists of, of a corresponding to a twisting pair are, are trivial. So we've seen examples which are which give non-trivial Zhang twists, but in the pointed co-commutative case, what this is saying is that we're never going to get any interesting Zhang twists uh, from a twisting pair. Okay, and then the last example I wanna talk about are examples that come from the FRT construction. So these are built from solutions to the quantum Yang-Baxter equation. So if we have a finite dimensional vector space, um, then a solution to the quantum Yang-Baxter equation is gonna be a, a linear map from V tensor V to V tensor V, which satisfies the following equation. So here R12 just means um, so if R is equal to uh, R1 tensor R2, R12 just means R1 tensor R2 tensor identity. R13 means R1 tensor identity tensor R2. Um, okay, so it satisfies this, this equation, then it's a solution to the quantum Yang-Baxter. Uh, and of course, the, the easier way to remember what the equation is, is to um, put it in, in some kind of picture. So in, in picture form, this is a lot more uh, natural of an equation. So, I mean, topologically, uh, topologically, it seems trivial. But of course, finding solutions to the quantum Yang-Baxter equation um, can, can be non-trivial. So we're going to use this um, this notation, so R of XK tensor XL, so given some specified basis uh, of XIs for V, um, this is, we're just going to denote the coefficient of XI tensor XJ in this by R IJKL. So given a solution to the quantum Yang-Baxter equation, the FRT construction gives a bialgebra A of R whose comodule category has a braiding that's given by, by R. So what is the definition of this by algebra? So we have N squared generators, T, T, I, J. And we impose the following relations. And uh, it's, it's a theorem that there exists a central group-like element uh, in this by algebra. So that to get the Hopf envelope uh, of A of R, you just have to localize by this one element. Um, so you just localize by, by G. And so you can observe just from the presentation in terms of generators and relations that actually this A of R does satisfy our twisting conditions. And then what we can show is that every twisting pair of AR um, is determined by its, its values on the generators and it satisfies so uh, these equations. For some matrices, uh, alpha and beta, um, and these matrices have to be inverse to one another and they have to satisfy uh, this equation. So, I mean, just the equation, equations that define the AR. 
Okay, so to look at a specific example, so one example are the quantized coordinate rings of matrices. So if you have n greater than or equal to two, an integer, uh, and, and q, an invertible element of the field, then the quantized coordinate ring of, of matrices is the algebra just generated by n squared uh, elements. And it satisfies these relations. So um, you can note that these are essentially the same as the relations in the, for the coordinate rings of, uh, of matrices, except now we have some, um, some additional cues. And this can be obtained by the FRT construction um, using the, the R matrix, uh, which is often denoted R sub Q, um, which is, is just the following. So here, um, V is an n-dimensional vector space, and we have some specified basis of it, which are the VIs. And then we can show what all twisting pairs of this uh, quantum coordinate rings. So yeah, so I should say, I guess, here I have written OQ of GLN. So this is going to be the Hopf envelope of OQ of MNK, the bi-algebra from the previous page. Uh, and as we've seen earlier, uh, kind of twisting pairs for a bi-algebra are the same thing as twisting pairs for its Hopf envelope. So classifying twisting pairs for one or the other amounts to the same process. And here, so twisting pairs are all going to be of the form. So here, this is the matrix um, phi 1 of xij. Um, this is just going to be multiply on the right by a matrix of alpha ij's. And then phi 2 is going to be multiply on the left by a matrix of alpha, by the same matrix. So where we have some invertible matrix. So again, this is something like conjugation. Um, in this case, conjugation by a, a, an invertible matrix. So what I'm saying in this slide, I guess, is all twisting pairs have this form. Uh, it is not true that every invertible matrix gives you a twisting pair, though. So if, if Q equals 1, then that's, that's true. I mean, this is something that we've, we've seen before. So then these maps. Uh, do form a twisting pair for any choice, any choice of an invertible matrix. Uh, if the characteristic of K is not two and Q is equal to negative one, then a matrix defines a twisting pair uh, as in the previous slide, if and only if it's a generalized permutation matrix. So in other words, there's exactly one non-zero entry in each row and each column. And if Q is not equal to plus or minus one, then it only form it only defines a twisting pair if it's diagonal. So a braiding on the category of comodules for, for H, this is a classic result, always gives a solution to the quantum Yang Baxter equation. And if R is a solution, then um, then the category of Comodules for A R localized at G uh, is is braided, and in that case, well, we can look at the two co-cycle twist of this Hopf algebra. Um, that's Morita Takeuchi equivalent. So we get also a braiding on the category of comodules for that two co-cycle twist. So now, using since we can classify twisting pairs for these things we can get some very concrete, we can produce new solutions to the quantum Yang-Baxter equation. So from specifically for the solution RQ that I showed a couple of slides ago, um, then we get, we get these new solutions, which I'm gonna denote by uh, RQ uh, sigma. So this is the new solution coming from sigma. Uh, and we can just kind of write explicitly down what these are. Um, in, in the different cases. So if Q equals one, if Q equals negative one, or if, if Q is not equal to plus or minus one. Here, all these, all the all of the deltas are just the, the Kronecker delta.
Okay, so that's everything that I wanted to say. So thank you again for this the opportunity to speak. Questions for the speaker? I think I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing hearing the question. There was a, a, a few slides back, an example with characteristic zero. And the question is yeah. about can you say it again to Mana? Yeah, this right one. here. Right, this one. Uh, right. Right. So the question is, do we know anything in in non-characteristic zero? So, like, where exactly we were using the fact that it is characteristic zero, and can you extend it to positive characteristic? Yeah. So I I don't know how to extend it to positive characteristic. It uses it because we're we're applying this this Cartier Gabriel constant theorem. Um, which is a, a theorem in characteristic zero um, to just to get a, a concrete realization of this Hopf algebra as a smash product. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't know how to try to generalize it. Other questions? Okay, if not, oh, there's one. Characteristic P might have finite dimensional pointed for P and other Hopf algebras. So in characteristic P, we have finite dimensional pointed for P and other In characteristic P, can you have what? What it? Finite dimensional. Finite dimensional pointed co-commutative Hopf algebras. Yeah. Sorry, could you could you repeat it? Yeah, Dan is asking if whether or not in characteristic P um, can you have finite dimensional pointed co-commutative half algebras. The question is, do we know do we know what they are, or do we have a um, examples? Are, are there examples? Yeah. Are there examples? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's something that I haven't looked at. Um, Here you could take like the descriptive enveloping algebra or something like that. You know, so that means that's a finite dimensional Hopf algebra, and you could probably smash it like this too in the same way. In characteristic P, you could take the restricted enveloping algebra and put it in an enveloping algebra. And you can get probably something finite dimensional. Can you hear me? Can you hear? Uh, yeah, I can't. I can't hear. Sorry, you're gonna oh, have to sorry. repeat it. Um, so in characteristic P, you could take a restricted enveloping algebra instead of. Uh, right. Yes. So you can you you can get finite dimensional points. Right. Yes, that's right. So you could use Frobenius kernels or something like that. No, it's the same thing because uh, the restricted enveloping algebra. Right. The restricted enveloping algebra is the dual of the coordinate ring of the Frobenius kernel. What if you took the smash product of the of the restricted enveloping algebra with the coordinate ring of the Frobenius kernel? So you could do that also. I guess I'm not really an expert on this. Probably, probably. So probably, probably. There's probably lots of examples. Yeah, that's a yeah. So that's a good that's a good point. So that's something that we should uh, that we should think about. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask a quick question on? I think it was like the last last slide. On the last slide, yes. That's the last slide. Yeah, thanks. There we go. 
uh, okay, yeah, so solutions come from gradings, and I'm wondering if these if these equivalences of categories between co-modules, are these just equivalences of categories as categories, or is uh, categories like with the braided monoidal structure? Um, yeah, I don't, I didn't quite catch the uh, end of the sentence. Uh, so just if these are equivalent, um, so these are equivalences of categories, do they respect the, the braided monoidal structures? Yes, right. They're equivalences of, of monoidal categories. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why we get from the braiding on one, we obtain a braiding on the other. Other questions? Okay. If not, let's thank Kent again.